I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. And today we're starting a new series called Creation, Evolution, Revolution. And we're talking about this most important subject of our origins. It's uh, about 200 years since Charles Darwin's birth and 150 years since his Origin of the Species was published. And so there's a lot of renewed debate going on right now about creation versus evolution, and, and even whether intelligent design and creation has even the right to be considered. Uh, recently, the Anglican Church officially made an apology to Charles Darwin for misunderstanding and uh, initially rejecting his theory of evolution. And, uh, and now cl they are claiming that it's entirely compatible with the Bible. And uh, although w one might say that it's uh, really just an attempt to maintain respectability in front of the scientific establishment. Now, what, is this the right way for a church to respond to this issue? And how should we respond when the scientific establishment, the media, the schools, most of the uh, denomination, historic denominational t churches all insist that evolution is a fact? And, uh, the, and we're e anyone that says any different is, is, is ridiculed. Uh, we're not really even allowed to question it. Well, first of all, we've got to understand the issues. And so we're not intimidated by the propaganda and the pressure to believe evolution. I want to introduce in this series the key ideas so at least we can think clearly and correctly around this subject. You know, the is this issue is so important. Our origins is so important because who you are, your self-image, your destiny, it's entirely determined by what uh, you believe about your origins. You know, that affects everything, really. Do you see yourself as an uh, advanced amoeba or as a creation of God? Are you uh, an accidental and incidental result of evolution? Or are you a special being designed by God for a purpose and valued by God? Are you made in the image of monkeys or in the image of God? Uh, are you an accident without a future hope? Or are you created with a purpose and a destiny that's higher and bigger than yourself? These are all fundamental issues. Do you have a a creator God who has the right to tell you what's right and wrong? Or are you just your own God with the knowledge of good and evil in yourself? Your, the answers to these kind of questions determine how you think about yourself and how you're going to live your life. You know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a story of, of a girl who came out of her biology class very depressed and, and they asked her, you know, wh why are you so down? And she said, well, I just learnt that I was, I was nothing. I'm just an accident. I'm just a product of, the, of, the, of a prime evil slime. And uh, I'm just an accident. I'm just an evolved monkey. And so they said to her, well, cheer up. Maybe you've got a better class. What's your next class? She said, self-esteem. And no wonder the young people nowadays are confused. And lack purpose because they're getting this message all the time that they're evolved. Well, what do you believe about your origins? Because that will control your self-image and how you live your life. I want to share today, uh, start this series introducing the, the three different views, the possible three different views about your our origins. You're going to believe one of these three, basically. And I want to do this by taking you on my personal journey. Uh, because I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Uh, I grew up agnostic, uh, which means ignorant, by the way. And my interests were science, mathematics, and astronomy. And uh, in my teenage years, I began to think seriously about my origins. I realized that the universe, perhaps, it either just happened uh, or perhaps there was a God who created everything and I wasn't sure wh which was right. It didn't seem to make sense that the universe 
uh, this amazing universe just came out of nothing without any cause. <coughs> but one possibility was that perhaps the universe always existed. And some claimed at that time with a steady state theory, but now science has clearly disproved that as a possibility. Yeah, for example, the second law of thermodynamics says that everything tends towards disorder, uh, towards a heat death. Uh, and that means that the universe is winding down and eventually it will run down completely. And this means, of course, that the or universe couldn't always have existed, otherwise it would have run down by now. The universe must have had a beginning. And the, the most popular version of that, of course, is the Big Bang Theory. Well, actually, uh, the idea that the universe had a beginning in the Big Bang was resisted by many secular people at first because of its implications. Because if there was a beginning, that implied a creator. And, and here, science was being consistent, was catching up really, with what the Bible claimed was true, that God created the universe out of nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. And, and that's why uh, when uh, this truth became undeniable that the universe had a beginning, that many physicists and astronomers confronted with this, they actually became believers in God. And uh, because they realized if this universe suddenly came into being, that implies quite strongly that there is a creator who did that. The, this creator, of course, is, is outside time and space, uh, as the Bible declares him to be. And so many became believers in God, at least, and, and some became Christians at that time. Well, that's the kind of background of the, uh, the time I was growing up, uh, and I wasn't sure what was right. If there was a God, I certainly didn't know him. And, but as I looked at the stars, uh, I, I was... I was thinking, is there a God who made me? I was aware that there was something great. I had this feeling as I looked at the stars. There was something great that was bigger and beyond the universe. But I could, couldn't put my finger on it. And, and you know, when you look through the telescope, that's amazing. But when you look through the microscope at the small scale detail and complexity of life, that's even more amazing. Whichever way we look at the universe, uh, it's, it's just breathtaking. The beauty, the complexity, the mathematical detail, uh, intricacy uh, of, of this universe. And it's hard to explain it and dismiss it as an accident. The more we find out about the universe, the harder it is just to think, oh, well, it just, just happened by accident. That seems, seemed absurd. So... Uh, Let's talk about these three possibilities of how life originated. And I want to take you on my journey through each one of them. The three possibilities are naturalistic evolution, or you could say atheistic evolution. That is evolution where God isn't involved at all. We're just an accident of this blind process of evolution. Uh, secondly, there is the belief of creationism. And thirdly, is a kind of compromise uh, halfway house between both of those called theistic evolution. And I went through each of these in turn. First of all, naturalistic evolution. What does that say? Well, life originated by chance. And then, having come to be as a first cell, perhaps, it then developed into ever higher levels of complexity through Darwinian evolution. And of course, we were taught this as school, as, as dogma, as the established faith of the secular world. And we were told evolution explained everything. There's, first of all, an evolving universe, uh, which then led to life starting on favorable planets such as Earth. And then life evolved from the first cell to man, from molecules to man. And the implication was, everything can be explained naturally. We don't need a supernatural God. We're just the product of blind, random processes, not the design of God. 
Now, the advantage of this, I suppose, is that it sets us free from having to be under divine authority and absolute morality. So as evolution has taken hold, we're into an age of relativism, where we decide what's right and wrong, and uh, I can be my own god. And uh, I, I must admit, however, as a teenage boy who, who didn't have any faith in God and, and very little idea of how li complex life really is, even the simplest life, in my gut I found evolution very difficult to believe. The idea seemed incredibly improbable, but somehow from an amoeba, you know, eventually that uh, became me. And uh, it was counterintuitive, even given millions and millions of years. But we were told by people who, who seemed to know what they were talking about that it was proven fact. And so I took it on board as best I could. But, you know, does it make sense that the universe just happened out of nothing and then life just happened? And then by chance, over millions of years, it developed its incredible complexity. Well, Sir Fred Hoyle, who certainly isn't a believer, he was a leading physicist he, uh, and mathematician, he said that this life originating like this, uh, out of just a, a kind of chemical soup, it, it, it's about as likely as an explosion happening in a factory of spare parts, and then suddenly a jumbo jet is formed out of that explosion and flies out. You know, he calculated the mathematical probability of the basic, of even just the basic proteins necessary for life, let alone DNA, uh, that just being formed by chance. Even somewhere in the universe, even over billions of years, and he found that the probability was effectively zero. It couldn't happen. And, and this uncomfortable fact that life just can't, couldn't have originated uh, is uh, often ignored by evolutionists. Uh, but that's the mathematics of evolution, and that was my subject. And so when I came up to Oxford to study mathematics, I was still in confusion over this big question. Uh, what, who made me? Am I an accident, or am I made by God? But then, for the first time, I heard the, the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. I heard about all the evidence for his resurrection and all the prophecies that he fulfilled as no one else could. And I realized then that the Bible, from beginning to end, had to be the word of God. And, it, and studying it ever since, I've seen how wonderfully the Bible is the truth and how it all fits together. And, and, and as I looked at the Bible then, as a young Christian, I realized that it taught something quite different from evolution. What did it teach? Well, that's the second area now, creationism. What is that? Well, creationism says that God designed and created all life in its present complexity to reproduce according to its own kind. So in other words, higher forms of life did not develop from lower forms. That's what evolution says. Everything evolved from the original simple cell and by these natural processes became all the higher forms of life. Creationism says no. God made each life form in its complexity and uh, it's impossible for things to become more complex by themselves. And, and so it says that, creationism says that God made each kind of life form with an inbuilt genetic variability and ability to adapt to its environment by natural selection. Yes, natural selection is true, of course. We'll talk about that. And, and through uh, that, then different, uh, as they reproduce, as dogs reproduce, they can create different forms of that kind of animal. But dogs will never evolve into a higher form of being because God made each major kind of being to multiply and diversify and adapt to their environment. That's the teaching of creationism. And so I was faced with this tension because 
the Bible, which I have now understood to be the word of God, was teaching creationism, it would seem. Whereas, uh, you know, and that's the book of Genesis. But then I've been brought up with evolution, which apparently was what the science says, that, uh, that no, we evolved. We were not created. So I was torn between these two. And it was actually quite a relief for a time to be told, actually, there's no real contradiction between those two things. I was introduced to something called theistic evolution. This is generally believed by um, the Christians in the historic denominations, Catholic or Protestant. And uh, this was a way, perhaps a clever way, of believing in both in evolution and believing in cre and in God, the creator. So this seemed to be the best of both worlds, it might seem. What the weak form of this, theistic evolution, is that God created the world in such a way that the laws of nature meant that evolution was bound to happen and it, it crea through evolution life came forth and then man came forth and there was no need for God to intervene in any other way. Now, it may be a stronger form of theistic evolution, which is what I kind of picked up to try and make it fit with the Bible as best as possible, was that, okay, God created the world, and then l God created life, because it was very hard to see how life could just come by accident. God created life in its simplest form, but then God used evolution, this rather this natural process, this rather inefficient process and even cruel process of evolution, um, the survival of the fittest, God used this process to develop life into its highest, uh, higher and higher forms. And then finally, after millions of years, we have a, an ape that managed to get up on its two legs and then God breathed his spirit into that ape and it became Adam. And so that was the form of theistic evolution that was uh, given to me as a young Christian. And for a short time, it, this kept me happy. As I say, it kept me happy only because I didn't really know the Bible very well. Well, then I heard someone speak on creation and, and that made me think again on a deeper level. And I came to discover, of course, that uh, evolution is not in any sense compatible with a literal reading of Genesis. And, and who are we to uh, not take God at his word as if he doesn't mean what he says in the book of Genesis, as if we know better? Well, in particular, what struck me was that the Bible said that God made everything good in the beginning and that there was no curse, there was no death. And, and it's quite clear that death and curse came in as a result of man's sin. Romans 5.12 says that death came in through Adam's sin, not before. But evolution says the opposite. In fact, suffering and death in the animal kingdom and so forth is an essential part of the process of evolution that, that apparently God chose to create us according to theistic evolution. Uh, and so according to that, death is not a consequence of sin, but that was, it was God's original idea. It was God's design to, to, to use evolution. And th this seemed to me to be a, a flat contradiction of the Bible. And, and it, it still amazes me today that good evangelical theologians, normally who are sticklers, you know, for upholding the word of God, would interpret Genesis as a myth just to preserve their evolutionary beliefs. But the convincer for me was that what theistic evolution meant and says about the character of God. You know, actually, the interesting thing is that it was this very logic that was behind one of Darwin's main motivations to reject his creator. Because he looked at nature that was red in tooth and claw, animals killing each other, all the cruelty, pain, suffering, and death. And he said, how could a good God make a system like this? And then when his daughter died young, this led him to look for an alternative explanation that didn't involve God. Well, had he turned to the Bible instead 
he would have found a perfectly satisfactory answer to, his, to this hard question of suffering. You know, the Bible says God is good, and he made this world good. And there wasn't the pain of suffering and death. The Bible calls death an enemy. But God, but God gave man free will. And when man sinned and rejected God, he rejected life. Man opened the door to death and curse. And it's amazing to me that man, who is to blame for opening the door to the curse and death, then when it actually happens, turns around and blames God for it. How blind can we be? Blaming God for all the destruction that came because of our sin. You know, God could have stopped things then. He could have judged man for his sin and said, that's it, finished. But instead, God chose to act in mercy and he allowed time to continue. And he delayed his judgment so that he can get his plan of salvation into action through Jesus Christ. So meanwhile, God had to let man have his free will and he had to allow his creation come under the curse, the consequences of that free will, the curse of suffering and death. Because God made man had to have dominion over, his, over the earth. And so the curse didn't just come on man, but on the whole animal kingdom upon the earth. But the important point is, that isn't how God made things to be. That's the result of man's sin. The cruelties we see in the world of nature are, are the result of man's free will, not God's character. And so believing in a good creator God doesn't contradict what we see in nature, because that isn't what how God made it. It's been corrupted, you see, by the fall of man. That's why nature's so wonderful on one point of view, because God made it good, but it's been corrupted by the fall. But, you see, Darwin's objection which was how could a good God create this system of suffering and death? This objection is still very valid for theistic evolution. Because according to that, God designed this whole system of suffering, killing and death. That was God's plan. How could a good God be behind the billions of deaths of innocent animals? I, don't, I couldn't believe that. It made it impossible for me to believe in theistic evolution because of the massive suffering and death that it requires over millions of years just to produce us. It, it was absurd to believe a God of love was behind this. But that's exactly theistic evolution, says God sovereignly chose this method. What does that say about the character of God? He would be inefficient, wasteful, and also cruel. He'd be responsible for this program where the strong systematically killed the weak and he would be therefore approving of millions of deaths of innocent lives. How then could he tell us that he was good and then command us to be like him in caring for the weak and needy rather than killing them off? It didn't make any sense. No wonder the Bible doesn't teach theistic evolution. It totally undermines the good name of God. It's in a sense, heretical against the character of God. If God is so powerful, why didn't he just create life as he wanted it, instead of using such a cruel method? And of course, the Bible says that's exactly what he did. He did create it, and it was good. And the curse of suffering came in through man's sin when he rejected God. You see, God gave man dominion over the whole animal creation. And, and in fact, in the beginning, and so the curse came upon the whole animal creation. That's why the animals started killing each other. See, the Bible says that God gave the plants to man for food. Man wasn't to kill the animals for food, and the animals under man weren't to kill each other for food. That only came after the fall. That contradicts evolution, which says that animals have always been killing each other for millions of years. Well, the Bible says that in fact God's will, you know, whenever you see God's will done before the fall, in heaven, when all is restored, there is no suffering and death. Therefore, that death and suffering, pain is not God's will. So, 
theistic evolution can't be true, that God willed such a thing? No. Well, that's my journey. I came to realize that the Bible was true, that he was a creator. But we might say, well, what about the scientific evidence of evolution? Well, we'll be looking at that later in this series. And I come to see that, in fact, there is no good scientific evidence for evolution. I'm going to prove that later in the series. I want to finish by reading the Bible's commentary on this debate. It's in Romans 1, 18 to 22. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because although they knew God they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened professing to be wise they became fools as the psalmist said the fool says in his heart there is no God 